Hi, this is Dr. L, and this is a video lecture addressing a little bit of content around the topic of prokaryotic diversity, although to be honest, we're mostly going to focus on bacterial diversity. So we're going to discuss the three domain tree of life, what, that's what TOL stands for. We're going to talk about um, how you can categorize bacteria from an evolutionary perspective or a functional slash morphological classification and that both are relevant and commonly used which can be really confusing when you're first starting to study microbiology or actually even years into the process. We'll talk about a few of the major categories of bacteria with some specific and hopefully interesting examples and we'll conclude this by talking about how there are some phylogenetic categories or taxa that we know exist only on the basis of DNA um, sequence data and that we in fact don't have any of them growing in the lab yet and how that um, means there's a lot of exciting work to do going forward. So this is an image of the three domain tree of life um, as first envisioned or described by Carl Woese and George Fox in a paper that came out in I think it was 1977. They made this map or phylogenetic tree by analyzing sequences for the small subunit ribosomal RNA sequence. The 16S in prokaryotes, which would be bacteria and archaea, and the 18S sequence in eukarya. They sequenced RNA, but today we sequence the DNA for those same genes. And they systematically compared this data, which all... Um, organisms have, all cellular organisms have, because they all do translation in the same way. And in doing that work, they first demonstrated that the cells that we had previously referred to as just prokaryotic cells, as in lacking a nucleus, that they are actually comprised of many different organisms that belong to two very distinct lineages or paths of evolutionary history, the domain bacteria and the domain archaea, and that these are very distinct from one another. They have separate evolutionary uh, trajectories. So looking at that, if we look at this three domain tree of life, which is something you should see pretty regularly in your biological studies, um, the very base of the tree would be the last universal common organism. It is, of course, extinct, no longer with us. And those organisms that are represented on the tips or the leaves of the tree are alive, and we can study them today. And this is a sketch of the overall three-domain tree of life. And in fact, there are many, many more phyla or categories um, for each of these major domains shown. So thinking about classification, we're going to zone in on microbial or prokaryotic classification. Um, it, it's really, to be honest, it's a bit of a headache. Um, and that's because it's a rapidly evolving discipline. And also because we have this long history of doing both formal classification and also functional or morphological classification. So on the left is a diagram that sort of lays out the formal ways of classifying organisms. So, you know, everything that's alive or cellular in this case, right, then can be classified into one of three domains, bacteria, archaea, or eukarya. Within each domain, you can then classify categories called kingdoms, phyla or a phylum, singular, then class, then order, then family, then genus, and then species. And in the bacteria, and this is also true for other organisms, but especially true for bacteria, there are levels below the level of species. So we also have what are called subspecies, we have strains, we have serotypes, we have different ways of busting up what is a species, because in bacteria there's a lot of in interspecies diversity. Like within a species, you can have a lot of variety, a shocking amount of variety. So I think you've seen all of that before in your studies, likely of animals or plants. Um, also really important though, and it's not old fashioned, it's still extremely relevant, is the classification of microbes based on their functions which would be their, their biochemistry or their metabolism or what they're doing, for example, in an ecosystem.
and or their morphological classification, like what they look like or what their cell wall structure is. So for example, are they gram positive or gram negative? And we can determine that by gram staining in the lab. We might also just lump them into a category called prokaryote, and that means they just don't have a nucleus. We might call them something a little more detailed like green, filamentous, and non-sulfur. So it implies that they're green when they grow. It Im implies that cells stick together to form filaments and that we can see that micro or macroscopically. And then non-sulfur might imply something about their metabolism or their habitat. More on that later. You might also look at or describe them functionally and uh, according to their preferences. So thermophile means they want to grow or can only grow under very high temperature conditions. Psychrophile is low temperature conditions. And there are a lot more words around all of that. So there's, there's both, right? So at any given moment, how you name or classify a particular microbe, it might depend on why you're talking about it or why you're studying it. So here's an example. Let's consider the bacterium Chloroflexi orantiacus. So this is from Wikipedia, which does a nice job busting out the evolutionary classification of all kinds of different organisms. It is in the domain bacteria, the phylum Chloroflexi, the order Chloroflexales, family Chlorofexaceae, the genus Chloroflexus, and then the species is Chloroflexi orantiacus. And I just realized that, you know, Chloroflexi disagrees with this genus name down here. And so there actually has been some renaming of this. And I think the Wikipedia Chloroflexus is the most accurate or, or recent. So I should really change that to, there we go. But again, you see this stuff is like constantly evolving, like the way that we handle these things. So that would place this organism or bacterium um, on this tree and the chloroflexi are going to fall um, somewhere around the area of um, green and filamentous bacterium, which is how the authors of this particular phylogenetic tree have mapped it. So they didn't write chloroflexi on the tree. Instead, they wrote green filamentous bacteria. So this lineage here contains the phylum chloroflexi and that's where chloroflexus or chloroflexi orantiacus can fall. It's confusing, right? So let's think about this from more of a morphological or metabolic point of view. So in this image here, which was taken at the uh, location at the hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, where chloroflexi or chloroflexi orantiacus was first um, recovered and grown in the lab. And so it might be tempting to think because these are green filamentous bacterium that it's this here. No, th these are actually algae. It's this transition over here from orange to green and maybe a little bit in here, which would be the zone where this particular bacterium lives. So it's a green non-sulfur filamentous bacterium when we classify it sort of morphologically, although it uses reduced sulfur, thiosulfate or elemental sulfur as the electron donor for anoxygenic photosynthesis. Anoxygenic photosynthesis is photosynthesis that does not produce oxygen, which is what green plants do or algae do. These guys are oxygenic photosynthetic organisms. In contrast, chloroflexi or chloroflexi orantiacus is an anoxygenic oxygenic photosynthetic microbe. And so it doesn't use it doesn't produce oxygen. It um, it use, uses and relies on sulfur compounds for its metabolism. It's also thermophilic, so it loves hot environments like a hot spring. This might not look hot in the picture, but that sediment is super hot. And it's filamentous when we look at it through the microscope. It grows into the in these neat clusters called trichomes. It might be called a green filamentous bacterium, but it's actually only green if it's growing in the sun. If you grow it in the dark, it's orange. So as you can see, this can be really confusing. And a lot of the time, the very first description of organisms will stick, even if later studies contrasts or provides conflicting information. 
So let's think a little bit more about some of the major categories of life that are shown in the bacterial domain. So we're going to just focus on bacteria here. Okay, and I've added and start up this figure which was taken from your reading. So there are, let's start by considering some of the deeply branching taxa or groups. So deeply branching or deeply rooted means something that is fairly close to these very ancient, now extinct ancestors. So it is those portions of the bacterial domain that we think are rooted very deeply, not the ones that are a little bit more recent, like the spirochetes and the proteobacteria, but they're rooted down here. And so let's focus in first on a phyla called the dinococcus thermus phyla. I know, like I said, it's a mess. It can be a mess, right? So we're looking down here at this particular phylum, and it's not even labeled on here, even though your textbook provides Dinococcus radiodurans as an example. But that phylum would be sort of linked in here. It would be a line somewhere in here where I've got these stars. And let me tell you why we're starting with this. Is these deeply branching or deeply rooted taxa Generally, the organisms that belong to these taxa that are alive today, they have metabolisms and morphology that we believe are reflective of the metabolisms and morphology of the organisms that represented the very first microbial cells and more recent but still extinct ancestors. So by studying these deeply branching taxa, the ones that are alive today, we can get information and we can extrapolate back to what it was like to live on the ancient earth back when life first formed about three and a half billion years ago. And so we know from planetary scientists and from biological studies that the ancient earth had a very different environment and very different habitats than we see today. Maybe some of those habitats still exist, but they don't dominate. So it was very hot. There was no oxygen because oxygenic photosynthesis had not yet evolved. Furthermore, because there was no oxygen, there was no ozone layer, and therefore there were incredibly high levels of ionizing or short wavelength radiation hitting the earth. So we would most certainly not be able to survive in that environment today ourselves as humans, or in fact, most of cellular life as found today on the planet. There was no plant life. Um, there were limited sugars available because there just wasn't actually a lot of life at all. So not a lot of complex organic molecules available and therefore, you know, you wouldn't be able to eat those things if they weren't there. There were instead many inorganic chemicals that provided sources of energy. So it's quite, you know, important to note that the first microbial cells to evolve on the planet would have had to be what we call now to be anaerobic, meaning they would use electron acceptors other than oxygen because there just wasn't any oxygen around in its free O2 form. They were also very likely to be autotrophic, meaning able to make their own sources of organic molecules to build cell structures. And that is hotly debated, by the way, because uh, whether the first organisms were heterotrophic or whether they were autotrophic is, um, is still an active area of research. There's also data that shows that it's likely that the default microbial shape was coccus or round and that rod-shaped cells evolved later and that they might have been a little bit more similar to the gram-positive cell wall structure that we see today. And again, all of that is hotly disputed. So just thinking about the ancient earth and thinking about those deeply branching taxa that exist today that we think are similar to the organisms found on the ancient earth, let's look at a few examples of those ta taxa. So let's go back to the one I mentioned a moment ago, Dinococcus thermus. Okay, so that's the phylum. And a fun fact, here's a really interesting and amazing microbe that belongs to that particular phylum. It's called Dinococcus radiodurans. And here's a photo of it. I think there's one in your textbook reading, but I took this from Wikipedia, which breaks out the phylogenetic categorization nicely from an evolutionary perspective. But a fun fact about this microbe, it was first isolated out of, of all things, a can of Spam which if you don't know what spam is, it's kind of canned meat, kind of like taking bologna and 
or hot dogs and like mashing them all up and putting them in a can. And that was a really important protein source for people during World War II when food was so was scarce. And there was some a lot of work done figuring out like how you could preserve that kind of canned food. And part of that involved, you know, experiments where you would treat that sort of food with very high levels of ionizing radiation. And back in uh, a research station in Corvallis in Oregon in the U.S. in the 1950s, subsequent microbiological analysis of this treated meat, this spam, recovered this particular organism, Deinococcus radiodurans, which grows in these inter interesting clusters of four cells. That's one, two, three, four cells. It's called a tetrad, and it's a unique characteristic of um, this, and well, actually a few other organisms can do it too, but it is characteristic of Deinococcus radiodurans. This microbe is, is just completely and totally amazing. It can, it can survive almost any sort of stressor, so it can can resist desiccation or drying. It is unbelievably chemical resistant, so it can, you know, withstand all sorts of chemical assaults that would kill other bacteria. And it is also able to survive under unbelievably high levels of ionizing radiation. So it can survive in places where we've had nuclear accidents. And this thing can thrive in the soil when other bacteria would die off. And so, therefore, it's gotten this nickname Conan the Bacterium. It's used as a model organism to study repair of double-stranded DNA breaks. So here's Deinococcus radiodurans. It's a cartoon of it, and there's its chromosome. MN is for manganese because the, uh, the chemical manganese is thought to be involved in some of the repair structures this organism hosts. You hit this thing with high levels of ionizing radiation. It will break the double-stranded DNA, and then repair will kick in. And so... We can go in and we can mutate genes that are important in this process, and then we can see if repair happens or it doesn't happen. And in that way, we can study double-stranded DNA repair using this as a model organism. All right, so thinking a little bit about the organisms that make up the various phyla on the bacterial domain of the tree of life, let's move out of the deeply branching organisms and I'll leave you to read in your textbook some examples for example for some examples from the phylum thermatoga and others and I'll just leave you with the Deinococcus radiodurans example that I just mentioned and let's talk now for a moment about a really important group called the proteobacteria shown here this is a group that was first identified or proposed by Carl Woes who came up with this tree overall back in the 1980s. There are so many proteobacteria. So that particular phyla is, is just, it's unbelievably diverse. It contains a lot of different organisms that are of medical relevance and environmental and ecological relevance. So if we take all the proteobacteria, we actually have to bust them out into these groupings shown here, the alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, epsilons and zetas and I wouldn't be surprised if you know before I retire we don't see a few other categories within here too. This is giving some qualities for some of the types of organisms that belong to the various categories of proteobacteria. So here's an example of an alpha proteobacterium and it is called Rickettsia rickettsii. It is always an obligate meaning it has to intracellular, meaning it has to live inside other cells, pathogen. And here it is shown inside some tick cells, and they are cells from um, material called hemolymph within inside ticks. When a tick bites you, especially if you're out west, say for example in the Rocky Mountains, um, you can be infected with rickettsia rickettsii through that tick bite, and it will move into some of our human cells and it will cause the disease known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, a nasty tick-borne illness that you can treat with antibiotics but is actually a little tricky to get rid of. Here's a nicer example from the proteobacteria. This is an example of an organism from the gamma proteobacterial group and it is called Alivibrio fisheri. Years ago it used to be called Vibrio fisheri, so you might find older literature with that genus name. Alivibrio is the genus, 
fisherize the species adjective. So it is an organism that is not a pathogen. It is actually something that participates in uh, mutualism. There's a spelling error. I'm going to fix that there. And it is a symbiont. It lives in relationship with the Hawaiian bobtail squid, which is shown here. This is a petri plate of the bacterium. This is the host organism that it lives symbiotic with. And if we looked underneath this organism, this squid, which is about the size of your thumbnail, they're really tiny, you'd see like a little uh, glowing organ. And the glowing comes from the ability of these organisms to emit light, which is called luminescence. And they will grow up inside the light organ of the squid. And then when the squid goes into dark water, it sheds light out the bottom. So if you're a predatory fish underneath it, you can't see the outline of the squid in the moonlight. And that protects the squid from predation. It's a technique or a strategy called counter illumination. And these two organisms live in very close symbiosis because the squid needs the microbe to survive against predation. And this particular organism can only live inside the light organ of the squid. So the squid provides it with a home and with food. So your textbook incorrectly says that the chlamydia group are um, within the proteobacteria and that's outdated information because in fact they belong to a phylum that is its own phylum. It's the chlamydiae. And it, it falls somewhere between, you know, so, or somewhere in this area, it would branch off between the proteobacteria and the cyanobacteria. So they, they are closely related to the proteobacteria, but they're no longer classified in that particular phylum. They're their own branch, okay? In fact, very closely also related to the cyanobacteria. Many chlamydia are, are pathogens. For example, um, there is an organism called Chlamydia trachomatis or trachomatis, and it's what gives us the disease known as chlamydia, which is a sexually transmitted disease that can be treated with antibiotics, but it can have very serious health consequences, and so it is very important to get treated um, and to get cured from that particular disease if you've been infected. So thinking again about just some of the example phyla that are contained with the domain bacteria. Let's think about the spirochetes. So the spirochetes is actually a morphological name. And so something I didn't say a minute ago about this particular figure, take a look at the figure and you'll see that some of the labels are in italics and some of them are not. So the ones that are not in italics usually represent larger groups that contain actual phyla with Latin names. So Planktomyces is an actual phylum name, whereas cyanobacteria is a group, and within that group there are multiple phyla. So anywhere we see a branch that's not italicized, there are multiple groups within it, and the phyla names differ from the labeling at the end of this branch. And I know that's a lot to take in, but, um, you know, there are a lot of different organisms, and so there's a lot of information to learn to start thinking about how to understand and classify these things. So the spirochetes get their name as a group from their twisted cell shape, and the twisted cell shape is due to the occurrence or presence of an internal twisting corkscrew-shaped flagellum. And I've mentioned this in previous information in previous or other lectures. And before I gave you the example of the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, also tick-borne. Let me give you another example of a spirochete bacterium, Treponema pallidum. It causes the STD known as syphilis, also treatable with um, antibiotics. So both of these nasty pathogens are spirochetes and they branch, you know, here in their own taxonomic grouping, which contains many different phyla. Carrying on, let's continue looking at the domain bacteria and we're looking at the, at a grouping called the Planktomyces. And the Planktomyces is its own phylum and it's italicized here. Here is the organism Planktomyces brasiliensis. So this is an example of where the species adjective tells us a little bit about where the microbe was first discovered, and it was in 
uh, water in Brazil. This is an aquatic organism and it's notable because it has some interesting cellular morphology. It can produce a structure called a holdfast which lets it anchor to surfaces in aquatic environment or it can just use a flagellum. The end's not shown here but this is a flagellum not a tube leading to a holdfast which allows the organism or cell to swim to another location. And that's kind of a neat ability for a bacterial cell to be able to make these two very distinct cellular shapes, one for attachment, one for swimming and transmittance. And they have different sizes, as you can see from the scale bars in, in this um, particular image. So this organism is, you know, it's pretty interesting for a bacterium to have these two very distinct morphologies. And so it's notable to mention it here. So other groups of bacteria, right, if I'm just going to take you back to this image for a minute, I'm going to point this branch out here, the gram positives, and it's not italicized. And so there are actually many phyla within the gram positives, and there are different morphological categories as well. So there are gram positive bacteria, for example, the families Clostridia or Bacillus, and um, these particular organisms are the um, low, let's see, are they the low? Am I getting that right? Yeah, they're the low GC. I'm going to type that in there. Low G plus C groups, meaning that if you look at their genomes, they have a relatively low amount of guanine and cytosine as compared to the high GC gram-positive bacteria. So you can take gram-positive bacteria and you can split them up a number of different ways evolutionarily or morphologically. We can morphologically split them up as low GC and high GC and in other ways. If we look at the low GC group, it's the Clostridia or the Bacillus. And I mentioned the microbacillus anthracis to you um, in your lab materials and uh, in conversation the other day. If you're taking my micro 467 class, I would have talked about this already. It's an endospore producing bacterium. It's a gram positive. Livestock can get it when they graze. So they pull some soil up and they get bacillus anthracis inside them. And then it can give them anthrax disease. And if humans are exposed to the cell or the endospore, they can also be infected with this very deadly obligate pathogen. And if it's not treated, it will be fatal. Um, it's a very dangerous pathogen. Other organisms that fall into that gram-positive low GC category are the streptococcus bacteria, the micrococcus, or the clostridium. Streptococcus pyogenes causes disease, micrococcus, um, there are a few different micrococcus species that can cause disease, and then clostridium could include like clostridium botulinum, which causes um, botulism which is a very dangerous foodborne illness. It's also, uh, that particular genus contains Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus and some other uh, problematic conditions. There are gram-positive bacteria that have high GC content in a family or a group that is um, within the gram-positive high GC category are the actinobacteria. Maybe one of the most famous actinobacteria is the microbe Streptomyces griseus, and it makes the chemical known as streptomycin, which is an antibiotic chemical discovered by Selman Voxman, who worked at uh, Rutgers University, and I actually got to work in the same lab when I was postdocing as uh, where this particular bacterium was discovered. It's a common soil-borne organism, produces this chemical, which works as an antibiotic against many different dangerous pathogens, including the TB-causing organism Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this was um, the discovery of Streptomyces griseus and of Streptomycin led to the award of the Nobel Prize um, in Chemistry and Medicine to Selman Voxman because it was the first antibiotic that was efficacious or that worked against TB, which was a pretty big deal. Uh, many years ago. Still a big deal today, but uh, years ago we didn't have drugs to treat it until Streptomyces griseus was discovered. So I'm going to conclude by just saying that I know that these concepts are confusing and that there, there's a lot to them, um, but bacterial diversity 
is an immense field. And so this is a paper that came out just a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was 2012, but you can look it up if you're interested. And you can't read any of the font here. Um, and I left it that way on purpose just to show you how much information is here. But this is a relatively recent three domain tree of life. So we've come a long way since that simple structure that Carl Woese and George Fox uh, produced, which was groundbreaking in its day. This is where we're at right now. This is a more current reflection of the state of knowledge. So here are the domains. The archaea are down here. The eukaryotes are in green, right? Eukarya, archaea, and we've expanded that archaeal tree a lot. So if you compare the different groups that are in this paper with just the few groups mentioned in the reading that I assigned to you, we're making huge strides forward in identifying novel groups of archaea. All of these are bacterial groups. All of them are bacterial groups. So we're identifying many, many new branches on the bacterial domain of the tree of life. A lot of them are what are called candidate phyla. So we only know they exist through DNA sequence data, primarily recovered through metagenomic analysis. Um, and that's that's a really important thing to know. Going forward, I hope that in the years to come, we will capture these things from the wild and we will be able to grow them in the lab and better study and classify them. But for now, know that everywhere you see a red dot, it's something that's been placed on the tree of life because we've got the DNA evidence that it exists, but we haven't yet actually looked at the thing or really been able to properly study it. So with that, I will conclude this lecture.